Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ranjana and I am uh, Senior Director of Programs at Impact Investors Council or IIC. Uh, IIC, as you all know, is an industry body to increase the flow of impact capital in the country. And we do that through interventions like events and convenings, enabling LPGP relationships, uh, research and analytics, and government engagement through policy. A very warm welcome to all of you for today's session, Navigating COP29, the Climate Investor's Guide. This session is a part of our climate program supported by NEE funds to build the narrative for the climate investments in India and how this has been transitioning over a period of time from large scale renewables to you know, innovative climate solutions at the early and mid stage. We pick up topics and sessions which are very topical and addresses some of the pain points of the industry. We've already uh, conducted sessions around SFDR, adaptation finance, new investable areas within the climate investing. Uh, and we really hope that to today's session is also able to add a lot of value for all uh, you know, who are looking at this session and attending this session. So this session is in partnership with Green Artha and we aim to providing uh, you know, a guide uh, to climate investors on how to navigate COP. COP, as we all know, is the largest gathering uh, global uh, event for global climate action, where high level discussions, policy decisions, and international agreements take place. But how do the investors uh, navigate and make the most out of it is what we are going to focus on. Uh, we have an excellent uh, panel uh, you know, for today's session. We have Mirik Kogri, a sustainability investor from Spectrum Impact. We have Nakul Zaveri, partner and global co-head climate leapfrog investments. We have Stalin Sharma, co-founder and partner Green Artha, Sukain Shah, principal investment officer from Neve Fund. And to moderate this uh, all-important discussion, we have Maya Chandrasekharan, uh, co-founder and partner Green Artha. So without much ado, over to you, Maya. Thanks, Ranjana, and uh, thanks so much to the IIC team. I'll start off by actually repeating what Stalin was saying just as we were in the waiting room, you know, when the IIC team suggested doing this session and asked if we would be open to, you know, helping think it through, we said yes immediately because, as Ranjana mentioned, COP is one of the biggest climate events of the year, and we believe that it's really important for India to be well represented there. Um, and we also understand that there's complexity around navigating a big tent event like this. So anything that we kind of as a group of panelists can share that would, might make this helpful or might make it easier um, for folks who are thinking about COP or planning to go to COP, I think is something that we're, we're happy to share and we're happy to bring forward over here. So a couple of quick points. Um, we have a couple of conversation topics that I'll run through that, you know, I'll cycle through with our panelists. But obviously, this session is really only as useful as the questions that you may have get answered. So please feel free to keep putting them into the chat. We'll either address them as soon as they come in or we'll gather them all up and, you know, throw them open to the panelists towards the end. Um, we really like this to be answering the questions that you have top of mind. Um, the other thing is that we'll try and make this both strategic and tactical in terms of inputs. So again, if there are specific things that you would like answered, feel free to jump in. Um, Ranjana did, you know, introduce our panelists today, and I will also add a little bit of additional detail in that we're really lucky because this is a very diverse set of panelists in terms of their COP engagement. We have some folks who have not been yet um, and are looking to go there. And then we have uh, folks who have been a couple of times all the way up to Nakul, I think, in whose case it's been four times so far. So I I think the, the feedback and the insights and the inputs that we receive will be both diverse and hopefully answer a number of different perspectives and questions that you have. With that, I'm just I'm going to start by actually quickly getting an understanding from um, Stalin first, uh, followed by Nakul and then Merrick on if you could tell us a little bit about your COP experience so far, 
and you know what took you to COP, um, and you know how did that how did that play out? And the reason I'm saying this is because, as I said again, COP is a big tent event. There are all kinds of different sessions that happen, so it's also good to get just a flavor of what's the breadth of events and activities. All right. Thank you, Maya. Um, so I've been to COP twice. The first time I was there, I think for 72 hours or less. And we had created an, uh, an initiative called the Green Startup Pledge to help non-climate startups start incorporating uh, climate action into their growth plans. And we'd partnered with groups like BCG um, and a few others. And so we were launching the event at COP uh, with the idea of being able to really bring additional uh, attention and, and insights into the opportunity for companies to think about decarbonization as part of their business as usual. Um, in that particular instance, I barely saw the COP campus. Um, last year, we participated in COP both for a few sessions in the uh, Blue Zone, as well as getting to uh, tour around uh, the green zone, as well as go to a lot of the events outside of the main COP events. Um, that's my experience. I'll hand it back. Just quickly before I hand over to Nakul, I think uh, I'm sure folks know this, but a quick clarification for anyone who doesn't, what's the distinction between the blue and the green zones um, and how do people essentially work through those? All right. Uh, the blue zone is where most of the negotiations happen. And oh, am I on mute? OK, sorry. Um, so the blue zone is where most of the negotiations happen. There's a lot of smaller closed door meetings and whatnot. Um, when I was going to the to COP the first time, there was very much this impression, like if you didn't have pass to the blue zone, it's not worth going. I would say quite the opposite after having spent time in the blue zone, spent time in the green zone and spent time at the other events. Uh, when you go to an event like COP, it's really to meet potential partners from around the world and most of them are not going to be in the blue zone. Uh, the learnings that you're going to be able to take to the world about India and the world, a lot of the learnings that you'll be able to take from the world back to India are going to be at are going to be through people. They're going to be at the events that you attend on the sides. They're going to be in the green zone when you're touring around and seeing what's happening in other countries. Um, and they're very much going to be potentially the relationships you build with organizations that maybe you've had interest in talking to or maybe have had some meetings with over video conference or whatnot. And you take the time to set that up because there are a lot of people that go. And so it's sometimes a very nice way to meet a whole lot of people from a whole, you know, from around the world in one place and, and kind of condense that. Thanks, Darlene. Um, so Knuckle, I think same question to you, you know, help us understand the couple of different scenarios that took you to COP. And I'll add one more layer to that, which is, you know, from those various experiences, what, how have you seen that essentially uh, interact with the work as an investor and you know that's I think a very specific question that a lot of people on this call will be asking themselves there's a lot of negotiations there's a lot of policy conversations there's a lot of ecosystem building as investors what's what's the takeaway you're on mute I, I can't believe I'm doing this again sorry um okay. Thank you, Maya and the IIC. This is uh, this is an interesting thing because when I went first to COP, there was this would have been helpful. Uh, my my COP experience has always been chaotic, uh, so it's important to understand it is high intensity, it's dynamic, and there is a lot of chaos. Uh, just to put this in perspective, um, and I'll tell you kind of the number of participants that attended. Right, so Glasgow in in 2021 were 39,000 participants. Shaun Sheikh in Egypt were 33,000. And then this just exploded in Dubai at 70,000 plus participants, right? And obviously because that was Dubai, that was a global expo venue. But, and and therefore the chaos just, just goes to a different level. One of the things, and, you know, when I went there last time, it was important for, for us to try and 
articulate it to ourselves why we are going. Um, the way we think about this is it is a place where global climate policy and regulation updates happen. So it's exciting to be in a place. Second is obviously there is networking opportunities, right? With governments, with NGOs, and with industry leaders. Um, there's also, as, as Tali mentioned, you are connecting with people who are exhibiting. There are people who are technocrats bringing technologies and innovations. So that is exciting. Um, and obviously there's a lot of insight coming through on what people are doing at different layers whether it is nature-based solutions, whether it's carbon credits, whether it is purely ESG principles. Um, and, and there are so many layers, right? It takes uh, a, a long time to process even once you've come back. Um, and then obviously there is making sure that there is some element of influence on climate policy and decision-making process. If you are in, in the right place, right time, right zone between blue and green, um, and and then as an investor, we try to um, synthesize a lot of what we are hearing there, right? Um, we try to meet uh, a lot of our stakeholders. We try to understand the investments that we are that we have already done, that we are doing, have certain tailwinds both in terms of um, uh, policy, but also trying to understand how um, the outcomes of previous COPs. Are they going to try and address them going forward? Um, and it's also trying to understand how much of headwinds we're expecting. So one of the things that happens is stock taking, right, in some of these COPs. And, and it allows us to realize if something hasn't worked out. Um, and so there are a lot of nuances. And every COP has a theme. And you know, I'm sure we will we'll go forward to this. For example, I think the Dubai theme was together for a resilient future, whereas Shamal Sheikh was climate change, global problem, local solutions. And therefore the discussions that take place are within that. Um, I'll just end with saying there's a lot happening. So take time to plan, take take time to distill. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Nakul. That's that's super helpful. And I'll, I think just drawing from all of the various things that you've said, um, I think that especially for folks, as you said, understanding tailwinds and headwinds, but also for folks who are looking at, you know, emergent trends across various geographies, this is really important. Uh, this is a place where it all comes together. Um, Mirik, I know your kind of your investing context is a little different from Stalin and Knuckles, and also your own experience is a little different. So, you know, I just wanted to throw to you to, again, get a sense of what took you to COP to begin with? Um, and again, what were some of the key takeaways for you? I think for me, it was a very interesting journey because the first time I went to Glasgow, it was very early in my climate journey. I practically knew only one person in the climate space and they got me some passes, one pass in blue zone and some in the green zone. So I spent most of the time in the green zone. I think, uh, and later years at Teramel Sheikh and Dubai, there was more understanding of what events are. The first time, as Nakul mentioned, it's pretty much only chaos. Then it's less chaos, but still predominantly chaos, I would say. Uh, I, I, I think one in very interesting thing, and to Starlin's point, the green zone for me is a very, very interesting space, which I think people under... And specifically the Glasgow Co-op, and it depends on what stage of your journey are you going. If you're genuinely growing from a learner's perspective, it is a brilliant place to really learn just what is happening in the world. And what is outside your box? So I'll give you a few examples for people, again, maybe not relevant, but just to highlight the diversity. Like there was a panel around how do you make sports carbon neutral? And there was like a big talk on can test matches be played in 2040 because of the heat and X, Y, Z. Then there was a panel around how do you use religion and influence from religion? And there was a religious panel of uh, one uh, Islamic uh, uh, cleric, one... Uh, uh, a church uh, leader and one temple leader all talking about how can you use 4.5 billion people who are religious in nature to prolong climate initiatives. And look, these are smaller, smaller perspective, which if you look at only from a tunnel of investing, you will never really get. And this is what sort of COP does offer in a way. Like you can suddenly get so much variety of perspective. So while I would say that planning is, I think, paramount because otherwise you will get lost. Uh, my also the other feedback would be Definitely plan for time which you are unplanned, right? 
So definitely go there with few hours, which you don't have anything and just explore. Like two, three things that I learned, which I have really in, uh, taken up in a big way from 2021. Before 2021, our ambition wasn't really very high in terms of what we wanted to do. So the sudden realization that this is the decisive decade, I think that was the big talking point at Glasgow. And that really increased our spectrum's ambition. And I think that's where we have started to really engage across the ecosystem in a more meaningful way. So that started from COP. I think the term blended finance, that's the first time that I had learned, learned it at Sharam El Sheikh uh, uh, in one of the closed room discussions. So it also depends on if you are having the mindset that I, you really want to learn. If you just want to go and participate and talk, okay, that's fine. But I think you sort of have to become like a sponge at COP and take everything that is coming at you and distill it out and that's when you are able to create the uh, best uh, impact and uh, I think the star investing angle also at least Dubai offered a lot like Dubai had this whole startup pavilion and everything like that so I, I think this cop I won't say it is going to be as big I, I would assume it's not going to be as big as Dubai nothing can be I feel uh, so it will be much more focused and I think it will be more policy driven uh, so but this impact investment, blended finance, and how do you create the right financial conduits, which not will not always be about venture capital. I think that's a big takeaway from a lot of these uh, discussions and how then can you plug into those uh, broader narrative. And I completely agree with Nakul on the tailwinds. I think there's a good sense of what the tailwinds are and that can really start informing your thesis building in a variety of ways, for sure. But I think definitely go with like a sponge like attitude and absorb a lot of things that you can extract the most value that will be my broad take at least thanks Merrick. and i think kind of linking both what you said and what nakul said right there is taking away kind of a narrow lens of going in as an investor as investors in any case our job is to see what emergent trends are see what tailwinds are and then synthesize and project that on for the next 10 years, because that's our time frame really of, of looking at the world and the market. And many of the things that you talked about sound very divergent, right? Um, making sports more climate friendly, but all of these will have follow on impacts on markets and on consumer behavior um, and on production and manufacturing. So I think that is really the mindset to go with, which is, as you said, learning about all of these things and then later on seeing how they fit with a thesis or with a mandate. Um, so Kane, now over to you. And I think in your case, the question is a little bit more uh, forward looking, which is, you know, from your perspective and from me Fund's perspective, what is it that you think would be interesting to get from COP? What would be your expectations, especially this year round, um, given some of the the things that uh, the other participants have shared. Oh, thanks, thanks, Maya, and thanks, IIC, for doing this. In fact, uh, we've not been at uh, at COP, and it was good to hear uh, what Stali and Nakul and Merik had to add. Uh, in fact, uh, from the diversity of it, I think we great to pick examples and learnings from what has worked in other geographies. Uh, because what we, in, in some of our trips, what we uh, figured out that, you know, Southern Asian, like a Southeast Asian nation, I've been looking forward to technologies what have worked in India, right, which they could take because A, geographically or economically, the problems are very similar. They cannot afford sort of uh, very costly uh, solutions to the climate problems. So what A, what's, what's worked well and what's not worked uh, globally could be really interesting. Secondly, uh, you know, Merit did speak about uh, blended finance. Uh, in India, as we speak, little has been done uh, in this space. Whilst it's an emerging sort of, uh, you know, stream of capital, but we would love to see what has worked globally and how this can really make an impact. Because I'd love to speak more. Uh, maybe it can get covered in the subsequent uh, sort of points also. But especially where you're talking of newer uh, technology stroke business uh, models which are solving the real world problems do need a development stroke you know very low cost capital which can make some of these uh, viable in the long term so probably these will be the uh, points which I would love to look forward to. 
Thanks, and that's actually a great segue because um, as we look at COP29, there are essentially three large themes. So one of them is unlocking climate finance, then formalizing carbon markets, and then increasing adaptation funding. Um, and I want to, you know, just get a little bit of maybe predictions from the folks on this panel who have, as I said, seen some trends in terms of either predictions or hopes and expectations around some of these themes. So Stalin, starting with you, um, you know, feel free to either pick one theme, climate finance, or on all three of them, it would be great to get a little bit of a, I think, forward-looking sentiment. Um, I, I loathe to make predictions. Um, I am very hopeful that more will come out in terms of climate finance and how to accelerate climate finance. Um, we hit 1.5 degrees last year, and I think we're really at a critical point where we have to be able to accelerate what we are doing in terms of climate action. And I think that there's no doubt that innovation is necessary for that and figuring out the capital instruments that are gonna drive climate action is really critical with particular emphasis on blended finance. Um, I'd like to say I'm hopeful on the carbon markets. There's sort of been the same handful of sticking points over the last handful of years around double counting and countries not agreeing on carbon markets. Um, but it is really critical that that moves ahead if India really wants to push ahead with the regional carbon markets that, that it keeps talking about. And in terms of adaptation finance, I think that this year is really the year that we kind of get to see what is coming to fruition in terms of the pledges that were made last year. Um, as Nakul said, I, I do think that this will be much more of a policy driven event. I am hopeful, um, but outside of that, I'm reticent to make predictions. All right. Actually, the one last thing I would say is given the mess of US elections, I would particularly guess that there might not be that many outcomes. The timing is interesting, if nothing else. So yes, uh, Nakul? Um, um, the reason I think we, we are talking about such massive numbers and such urgent need is because climate is, is a compressed growth requirement, right? It's not a, it's not a story. And I keep on saying this climate is touching everything. Right, so it's not a classification. It's a, it's unlike anything else. It's not an industry. It's not a technology. Um, it's not a category. Right, and therefore, what's happening is usually industries take decades to evolve, and go through subsidy, product market fit, ecosystem building, and then eventually landing where a tipping point comes in terms of mass market and late market adoption. Um, uh, in a in lot of sectors in climate, this is, this is happening so fast because of the urgency of it. And even more so when it comes to low income or, or geographies where you don't have access to resources to address this. And if you keep that, some of the elements that you mentioned are absolutely required in terms of blended finance, carbon and adaptation needs. But a lot of these things for private capital to go in is still known unknown and unknown unknowns right so so there is that confusion and and cop plays a very critical part in solving parts of that uh by discussion debates uh but at the same time we are also seeing we getting pulled out in the sense the way blended finance is thought about is that you you need that finance because it's not commercially viable and therefore you need to blend it with a local i think we don't we we the debt in emerging markets for commercial finance itself is low. And now we're asking for blended finance to take over. And therefore the ecosystem is not ready. So a lot of this thing needs to be done. I'm, I'm, I don't have answers to this. I'm just telling you where we are realistically. Carbon markets, I did my first carbon deal in 2006. I thought this would be fascinating. Um, it's not been. Uh, I think carbon markets are critical. They're important, they'll solve a lot, but it has now become uh, a government 
issue. Governments are actively taking part of it. Um, you know, the, the voluntary carbon market, which is supposed to spearhead this, is still very small, close to about $2 billion. The, the regulatory or the compliance carbon market is about a trillion dollars. So there is somewhere um, the evolution is happening. We believe that there will be so, slow progress, um, definitely between countries, but there could be inter-country uh, plays that could be exciting. Uh, adaptation, I think everyone wants to do adaptation. The taxonomy is still ambiguous. Um, a lot of people don't know where adaptation opportunities will come through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you if you talk about billions and trillions going into mitigation, uh, there is a minuscule amount that goes into adaptation, and itself uh, is is going to be challenging. We believe adaptation is critical purely from the fact that our, as Stalin mentioned, right, the one point five to three is happening so fast. Um, if we don't ready ourselves uh, to face those challenges, um, it, it's going to be a challenging year. So the question is not not do we need adaptation, saying where do we start building opportunities where we start superior risk-adjusted returns while doing impact. And therefore, taking a step back, there are different pools of capital that will be important. The philanthropic side, the government side, the the concessional or the blended side, and the commercial side. Um, and there are different stakeholders. We are seeing what's happening in the West right now with the word using climate and ESG, whereas we are seeing what emerging consumers are going through. Um, so a lot of challenges. I'm sorry, long answer, but I think, again, therefore the relevance of COP becomes important because you also start seeing governments taking different stands, um, both from a substance perspective and from a form perspective because of political uh, elements as well. So... That was it. Fantastic, Nakul. Thanks. I know uh, you said long answer. I would say super comprehensive and really interesting because so many points came up there. Um, you know, just the very last point that you talked about in terms of adaptation financing and how it informs a whole variety of different types of capital providers and instruments. Uh, and I think that's something that is important to call out, right? These are big, as you said, policy decisions but they impact many different types of players and stakeholders. And that's really, I think, the, the big takeaway. Um, Mirik, from your perspective, are there things that you're hoping to see or expecting to see on uh, any of these? Look, I think expectation, one thing sometimes COP becomes like every year COP is there, so we need to expect a big thing. It, I don't think it happens like that. Like it happens, it's its own pace because issues are complex, I think. But if you look at one of the broader things, to unlock climate finance as well as adaptation funding, it has to be, if you go to the core, some reforms at the multilateral development banks, uh, that is becomes very, very crucial if that doesn't get reformed in various ways. And that links to taxonomy and some other things as well. But I think the whole point is, like some of these are more, uh, what do you call, it? targeted leverage points in the system, which if you can unlock, then that can unlock a lot of capital in a big way. And I think... Uh, and I know, remember, I don't remember exactly what happened, like the, but the Bridgetown initiative that was started by Mia Motley a uh, few years ago. And like, and we are all, again from a philanthropic angle discussing with some of these sort of financial tools or leverage points which can unlock big capital for adaptation. And I think understanding how they can get reformed becomes very, very crucial. So rather than just looking at the numbers of whether it's 100 billion or whatever X billion dollars, I think. Uh, and I know the good discussion is happening, but reform that strategic point in the system and the hope and expectation if they get solved, then the money really starts flowing uh, in a big way. So uh, I think uh, I do not really have very big expectation in terms of this will happen, that will happen. Uh, but this, some of this will be incremental in nature. But my my hope and expectation is rather than looking at focusing on announcements. The bad thing about COP, I think let's also discuss that. It's too much announcements. Everyone wants to just announce things like this is happening. And when you actually sum it up, if you look at some much of all amount announcement, I think it will be more than global GDP, something I think just a joke. But in principle, like everyone is just announcing so many things and announcing that we have captured so much carbon more than what is emitted. So we need to really, it's almost like a greenwashing festival in some ways, like this is happening, that is happening. So how do you cut through the noises also becomes important. So the expectation and hope would be to just move away from a lot of these things. Although your uh, growth may be incremental, that's fine. 
but let's not paste a paint a picture that things are going in a big way and then when you someone scrutinizes like one bit and you realize nothing is happening so uh, less on announcement is my bigger expectations in life from cop uh, and more on uh, actual deliverable even though it may be slow that's fine uh, I think that's the more broader picture, I would say. So I think that's great. Essentially, your message is, the expectation is let's have fewer expectations and more action. So um, on that note, Sukhain, you know, same question on any of those three issues uh, as it pertains to your work or even just your interests around climate, um, anything that you're hoping for? I, I think actually Mirik summarized it very nicely. Uh, you know, some of the things which we are observing is a key role in a lot of these activities are at the policy level on, on reform of the sectors, as well as how the development banks or the multilateral uh, organizations are actually looking at funding. We're seeing, you know, wise for all the great statements being made, capital is still not available cheap. Okay. For all the, you know, so-called DFIs, it, it's not cheap capital that, that is available uh, you know, across whether it's to to GPs or to companies, and uh, is there a better way to unlock some of this capital? Uh, definitely yes, but that will come with political mandates, right? The government has to mandate uh, in in reality rather than than, than just making up uh, you know uh, larger ambitious goals. Uh, like like we've seen, you know, what happened in say EV as a sector, right? It, it's done reasonably well because of the subsidies on the government side, uh, opening up the sector, as well as uh, scalability of the sector. But if you have to create sustainable long-term businesses in say adaptation space, at, at NEE 1 and 2, we we have about 38% of our capital invested in adaptation companies, right? And and we, we were probably the first investors, not just in those companies, but in those sectors. And now to actually get uh, capital, especially during those stages where you're raising say five to 30 million. Uh, and my thanks for the opportunity. We recently wrote an article, uh, right, about the missing middle. I think if you're able to address where, uh, yes, there is proof of concept, but there is yet a time where it can actually get scaled and attract commercial capital. I think if work is done in that 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 line, then a lot of, lot of businesses will get unlocked and therefore capital will get unlocked from the commercial space. If I can add uh, to Sukhain's point, effectively, it's FOAK financing, right? You need to figure out the right financial tool for first-of-a-kind plants and business models. And I think that is something where it's a... And that's something that we have been also thinking about and working. And I know the good thing about at least the climate week this time in New York was there was a lot of focus on FOAK. And I think the realization that this is like a crucial piece of the puzzle, like the value of death after the product has been built is going to be FOAK. And if that is figured out and I, I am talking to a few folks on FOAK for the global south is a different beast altogether. Because what happens in uh, global north, the government is a big enabler. Like if you look at Department of Energy and all that in US, large checks are being signed. So FOAK for the global south as an area is an important area. Again, I am not sure from a COP perspective what is the focus there, but as an ecosystem, that's something that definitely needs to build. And maybe some of the DFIs and they can enable some fund around FOAK because otherwise a lot of these things will get stuck at five ten million dollar raising and then what do you do once the bigger plants are required and still at a high risk? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a topic I think that at Green Artha as well we feel very strongly about and, and focus on. Um, there are a couple of questions that have started coming in, but before we do that, I want to take uh, a little bit of inspiration from Mirik's what COP is not, or, you know, what is the bad side of COP? And um, throw kind of an alternate question to the panelists who have attended. We've talked about what to do at COP. To just flip that on its head, um, what not to do when you go at COP as, you know, just thinking about what are the things that people may not derive value from? Sterling? So I, I think in part because as several of the, as Merrick and Nakul both said, there are, there is a lot of chaos. One of the things that I have noticed is that for a lot of 
uh, participants, they go with people they know or they know other people who are going and they have a propensity to kind of go to the events they know for the organizations they know with the people that they know. And that can really limit the value that you take away from COP. This is really a, an opportunity to represent India and the great things that are happening here to the world. And it's also an opportunity to really see what's happening in the world that can have a really meaningful impact on India or a really significant risk in India. And understand and kind of take the time to think about how that might influence your portfolio, how that might influence how markets move and whatnot, um, whether that be in relation to capital technology or, or even larger social movements. And, and so I'd say really kind of take the time to get yourself out of your comfort zone. Rakul? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's not much of not to do because it, it, again, as I said, I still believe that if you want maximum out of co-op, you'll have to thrive in chaotic environments. While yes, it you get the lay of the land every time you go, but it is still chaotic uh, because it's a new venue, there are new themes, there are new people, um, and it's also highs and lows in terms of the feeling of climate, right? I mean, there could be a low, depending on which what happens in the US elections, we'll see what kind of a feeling there is uh, at COP generally. But I think at a micro level, don't go for a very short period of time. Don't go for a day or two. It's not worth it. Uh, three to five days, ideally good. If you're there for five days, I think you'll really, by the third, fourth day, you will really start making sense of what you want to do because it will take you time to understand this. Um, you know, also to try and make sure that you have those six or seven organizations you want to meet or you want to try and meet your stakeholders kind of preparing for, from that. Um, also, I think there are cultural nuances. I think one of the things that was important for me is to appreciate uh, cultural nuances of massive amount of attendees, right? Um, it It is so dispersed, it is so diverse. Uh, and so just trying to understand and reflect on how to engage with that cohort yeah. is is important. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we as Indians also uh, take a lot of things granted in the global South arena. Um, and that's not not true because, you know, there's so much more learning uh, of, of what happens. Uh, and then, yeah, don't burn out. Uh, there's another way of, I, I don't want to generalize this, but I know that I keep on doing so much that every day I'm just burnt out. And, and you don't want to do that because you want time to, again, make sure that you are, you've, you've got a day job that takes place. So, uh, and, and um Every location is different. So Sharm El Sheikh was different to Dubai, to, to Glasgow. So even networking is going to be very uh, nuanced. Uh, Dubai, it was just very large. So you had to walk from green to blue was a logistical nightmare. Sharm El Sheikh was not as much. Uh, I would have expected the other way around, right? Uh, so some of those nuances, you'll never get to know. Uh, and again, this is all in hindsight. So please take this with a lot of pinch of salt. Um, uh, I think if if you if you can go, just go there. First cop is going to be a lot of learning. Yeah, and I think that's really to come back to pretty much the first thing that you said. Don't go for a short period of time because you just don't have enough time then to absorb all of this. And then on day two or day three, start to actually really derive value. So... Uh, I think that's that's super helpful and um, it's a good way for people to really think about this is not one of those conferences where you literally just fly in for the sessions and then fly out the next evening. Uh, that's not the best way to to get value from it. Mirik? I think more on a tactical note, wear sports shoes. <laughs> that's the simple uh, thing because sometimes, uh, yeah, yeah, otherwise it's, yeah. I always did that, I knew it, but I knew it, at least in Dubai, uh, yeah, it, it's a genuine challenge. Right? If you're going to walk around from place to place, again, depends on the venue as Nakul mentioned, but just on a, uh, be comfortable. The broader point being, do not, like, it is a very expansive space. You are going to spend a lot of time in multiple areas. So I think uh, the burnout question, sort of extension of that being, being more comfortable. And I think there are going to be a lot of clashing events. So my view also will be like, just to Charlie's point, don't get into your comfort zone, things that you know, 
like there is a, so much variety in terms of perspectives that you can get into the table so definitely stretch yourself in terms of the mind uh, if not the body body is fine you uh, pick a sweet spot there but at least in the mind sense i think uh, do not get very much attached to only the agenda that you came up with uh, and things like that and uh, yeah that that would be my broader sense a lot of the points stalin and nakul covered but uh, yeah yeah i think that's my broader thought process thanks so now um, you know just in the interest of time we'll throw in a couple of questions from the audience and the first one i'm going to keep it open i i would actually love to hear from as many of you uh, on the panel as possible on this because i think it's a uh, it's an interesting one so how would you think india should be best represented at cop is there uh, a specific type of session that you have that you would think would be a really good way or a couple of different types of sessions for india to be able to represent all of our various perspectives uh, opportunities and i would say innovations uh can i go uh so i think one thing that i felt about the india pavilion last time and i think that's something my point also like we have to have a learning mind that sometimes it's every not only india every country wants to just to case what they are doing what they are doing what they are doing i think the whole point from a pavilion or a country perspective is what can we do together like that kind of differentiation and i am talking generally it's not only india i think every country the whole mindset is we are doing this we are doing this we are doing this and sort of again coming to the whole point of showcasing announcements and things like that i think that whole nature or representation from a pavilion perspective or a country perspective needs to be more open and minded in terms of you will require collaboration right it's not going to be like you can do everything anyways so again that's a higher level perspective but that would be my thought process that in the future as india and every country gets representation it's more thinking about the collaborations or thinking about working together rather than just telling okay i have done 10 gigawatts and something like that right? that's fine you mentioned that but go beyond that right so that will be my reflection at least so yeah so what i'm hearing is more around kind of open questions um seeking collaboration versus Invite inputs again. as well, right? Again, again inputs, making invite, announcements, right? Ah, uh, invite inputs. Give. Yeah. In fact, my my view would be give your challenges, right? The world is there. There will be people out there. Like tell the challenges that are being faced by the countries. Again, more broadly to everyone, not only to India, but right. Because that's when you can get the answer. If you are saying everything is rosy dozy, then obviously no one is going to come to yeah. you with solutions. So that my put out problem statements as opposed to again, as you said, declarations and announcements. If if I could add to um, you know basically if similar thoughts uh, you know basically how do we exchange technology and if there's any way to open markets uh, right for some of these applications which have worked globally you don't need to recreate it uh, here and and vice versa there are we, what we are seeing is there is lot of interest uh, of for some of the technology that we've invested into uh, in in the global south. Uh, again, reach is a challenge. If you are able to collaborate, then I think a lot, lot can happen beyond just the the investment or the the policy side. I have a different point of view here. I think we need to appreciate this is essentially uh, when this started. This was a government to government negotiation platform. uh so what governments are coming in and demonstrating and optimizing and showing form to negotiate a lot right and and i've experienced this before um what we want versus what we can commit versus what we can do and especially countries like india um i don't know singapore who um are are in in areas where there's there is the 1% population which is demonstrably richer Uh, or high income compared to the west um and and we are also uh, um competing with the global north in terms of manufacturing and technology there are some of the commitments government will have to balance um and therefore negotiations will take a, a tone of how we want to demonstrate where india is at the same time obviously you know um, there is this has become much more commercial in terms of participation and technology and and opening pools of capital um this is i think as as american and the others know this is spearheaded by ministry of environment and forestry 
um, uh, and climate change. Uh, and yes, it is pretty much a showcase of what India has achieved um, through through many years and why it believes in a certain, and it's not only India, it's, it's pretty much everyone else, including Global North or Global South. Um, so I'm, I, I, I would love for it to change. Uh, but I I would be surprised. And that's why I think it, it will go in a slow manner. And again, to what Merrick said, a lot of this commitments um, will be made, announced, but follow-ups will take time. Uh, they will go through government channels. Some of these things will be debated. Do, do countries want to be seen as global south or do they want to be show, seen as committing capital to, to loss and damage, for example, right? And what should their percentage be? I think these are all really great points. I think that for most of us who attend, it's less about how can we shape kind of the larger agendas or the the uh, decisions that are happening. And really the opportunity to represent India is going out, meeting people, talking about what is happening here, being open and avid learners, trying to do that problem solving or collaboration and and really kind of take that upon yourself as you're going out and meeting people, try to build the common ground. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think retain the optimism that I, I see in the market in India. Okay, and any additional thoughts? I think uh, the you know points have been made and I've added mine. Man. I think nothing more to add. Thank you. Great. Um, one very specific question. Um, really something that sits at the heart of of every GP all the time. Will there be LPs at COP? <laughs> and is it a good place to meet them? I see everyone smiling. So I don't know what that means. Is that a resounding yes? That's a yes, but we are, where to find them. There are always <laughs> there are always LPs. There are always LPs at at most of these events, but I think it's not a fundraising event. And I think Stalin again put it right. I think there is if you go with a a very, very micro agenda, uh, you're not going to enjoy the experience, right? This is a macro agenda and what Merrick put it. Uh, you need to immerse yourself. Uh, there is so many things that are always happening across. Uh, I think it's a good place to connect with LPs if you already know them. So they see you, they see you around, they see your commitment to co they see you uh, attending sessions, but I don't think it's a place to pitch. Uh, they may not have the right kind of time, but yeah, there'll be, there'll be the usual DFI LPs, right? Non-commercial LPs. Yeah, I think that's a great point, uh, Nakul, which is they will be there. It's a time to build the relationship, but not really to do the, the hard sell. That's not the, the venue for that. Uh, we have, unless anyone else wants to add to that, we have one more question, which is actually, I think, a little bit more entrepreneur focused, but I'll just ask in any case and see if the panelists had thoughts. Um any I, any suggestions for how entrepreneurs should be navigating costs? Uh, so I think there are two aspects, I would say. Again, if you're an entrepreneur already building something or if you're an entrepreneur wanting to build into climate, I think if you got the second type, this is the perfect place. Like You will literally see what everyone in the world is talking about. So as an entrepreneur trying to get into the climate, I think it's like... The world is your oyster kind of a thing. Just go and understand whatever is happening. Uh, I think, again, it's the tailwind that Nakul mentioned. Like, if you're an entrepreneur in a specific space, just understanding the broader macro landscape. Because sometimes as entrepreneurs that I see in, say, our portfolio in general also, you tend to be obviously rightfully focused on your business. This can give you the 30,000 feet view suddenly. Okay. Although we may be doing good in business, but it's the macro trend holding true. If you're, say, in the carbon markets and in that space, you might be doing... Good is the micro lens, but if the broader discussion is not going well, you know there is headwinds coming in the future. So I think getting a 30,000 feet view from an entrepreneur perspective, I think is definitely interesting. And maybe that's the area that can be looked at. But again, eager to hear the panelists. I would agree with Mirak. And I would say the other 
aspect that can be, you know, I don't think that this is like a fundraise trip for entrepreneurs either. I think that there's a lot of technologies that we may not always be aware of um, that might be in the same space, might be in adjacent spaces. And it's really an opportunity for entrepreneurs to get a much better understanding of their product within the larger global context to understand where are maybe competing technologies that aren't existing in their own market so they can understand what the real scalability and market opportunity is you know, beyond India, if that is within their ambition. And I think the other piece, sorry, just to add on one little bit, is if you get past that phase of like the chaos or, or if you thrive in chaos, it's also like really an opportunity to, to see and meet a lot of people that can really leave you feeling inspired if you get beyond uh, the announcements. Yeah, so I think really what I'm hearing from the panel is when you think about COP, don't go in with sort of micro ambitions and micro goals. Um, give yourself enough time to explore and go in with an intent to learn and to question, to ask for feedback, you know, to to see what's what is the best of what's available out there. Uh, and just be kind of open to all of the opportunities. So, you know, just to quickly sum up, I think some of the things that we've all said on this panel, right? Like have, be comfortable with the chaos, just go in there and be open to being outside of your comfort zone. Um, it's all really about the learning. Um, and yeah, tactically wear sneakers, hydrate, I guess less so less so this year, but in general, I would say wear sunscreen. But uh, this year, I think that may not always be the case. I'm not sure. I can't really talk about uh, the, the UV factor in Baku, but we'll, we'll see about that. Um, on that note, Girish, I think I'd like to hand over to you to just close out the session. A big thank you to our panelists. Um, when we started off the session, I did promise you know, the audience that we would have both strategic and tactical insights. And I think we've got a ton of those. So very grateful to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya, for that. Very kind of you. And uh, thank you so much for the very elegant and eloquent uh, moderation of the session. Uh, for all of us who have not attended COP, uh, this was surely a great uh, learning experience. And uh, at the risk of sounding immodest, I must compliment Ranjana for having chosen the right word, navigating COP29. Very, very apt, if I may say. I would also like to thank all the attendees and IAC members who uh, joined us today, and I hope you also benefited from the session. I would like to specifically thank Merit Gogri, Sustainability Investor with Spectrum Impact, Nakul Zaveri, Partner and Global Head at Leapfrog Investments, Stalin, Co-Founder and Partner, Green Artha, Suken Shah, Principal Investment Officer at Neve Funds for joining us and for sharing your experiences, learnings, and memories. And uh, thank you so much, Maya, for that superb moderation. Very kind of you to have done that. Uh, I would also like to thank and acknowledge NEEF funds under whose edges uh, we are running this program uh, from awareness to action, advancing India's climate finance agenda. A big thanks to Ranjana and Sonali from IIC and other IIC members, Neha, Divya, Vidhi, Isha, Vishal, and Prashant for your behind the scenes hard work in putting this all together. IIC will soon be sharing a proceedings report on today's event for the benefit of all those who attended. And uh, thank you so much. I hope it was useful for everyone who joined in today. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, IIC. Thanks. Thanks thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.